here. Uh, Alex Hoare speaking for the Conservation Commission's Subcommittee on Land Use. And we're going to start our meeting today at um, 1140. And we have present Commissioner Bruce Dedman and uh, Michelle Lobb. And we're delighted to have Dave Zomack have time to join us and Aaron Jock for uh, the support that she gives us. So with that, we'll go over what we're gonna talk about today. And so anybody listening will be aware. Can you remind us, Aaron, what, uh, um, um, well, first of all, we had a little scramble there in the emails about the ag document being loaded into the folder. And I think we've gotten that straightened out so we don't need to talk about it. Bruce, yes. Bruce forwarded draft 16, which was a little different than the draft 16 I had, but uh, uh, he says that's the one with the correct heading that the commissioner should. That was on. my, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, on our agenda today were um, discussion of beavers, dogs, camping, hunting. Um, we we didn't get around to um, rules and regulations at the last meeting. Um, so I don't know, kind of, I guess I'll defer to you, Alex, what, um, how you want to attack the, the start of the meeting in terms of content. Well, we're not going to cover all of those in one hour. Oh, no, we have an hour and a half. Can you, and Bruce, you're able to be with us for an hour and a half? Yeah, the fishing's over. Surveying is over. And Michelle, can you do that? Probably. I'll try. <laughs> Dave? You're on mute. I'll do the best I can. I, I yeah, I'll stay as long as I can. I've got a big... Uh, issue uh, I'm presenting to the regional school committee tonight about the track and field. So a uh, little bit stressed today, but I'll hang in here as long as I can. <laughs> You're amazing, Dave, for all the things that you cover. Um, we're not going to cover all those subjects in one meeting. We'll have to figure out the order in which we we cover them if the commission gives it gives us an extension. But how about if we talk briefly about dogs? Um, and I'd like to lead with the email that I sent to Dave a while ago uh, about the possibility of requiring dog training in order to get a license in town. Is that something worth talking about? Um, it's been a while since I looked at that email. Um... You want me to refresh your memory? Well, I think there were two things that were posed related to dogs, and I can't remember who 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 posed them. One was about dog training. The other was about information. I think it might have come from Michelle. Uh, could we, when the renewals for uh, dog licenses come up uh, annually, could we provide dog owners with uh, information on the uh, town bylaw requiring leashing, et cetera, et cetera. I think that might have come from Michelle, if I'm not mistaken. And then yours was about dog training, uh, verification of dog training. It, did I get those right? Yeah, I didn't see Michelle's uh, email. I think that probably just went to you. But um, I did write to you saying one of these days we're going to bring up dogs. And at the time, um, I, I asked if you might be able to talk to folks in town, particularly the attorney, to find out if there's anything that would stop us from advancing the idea of requiring a certificate that somebody has completed a bona fide uh, obedience training, obedience training. And, uh, and I also wrote that I didn't think that that would be a hardship financially because Dogs are expensive and people have them voluntarily. So I, and I, I wrote that I thought the benefits of that would be that uh, dog training is more for the owner than the dog. 
And from where I sit right now, looking out over Cottage Street and the sidewalk, I see people being led down the, the road all by their dogs on their 25 foot expandable leashes all the time. And I've seen one person yanked by her large dog uh, into the air and landed on the road on her head. And um, she had no control over her dog. One of the issues, dogs are required to be licensed, not just because of rabies, but because since colonial times, owners have been held responsible for damage due to their dogs, livestock predation particularly. Uh, cats are not licensed, parakeets are not licensed, but dogs are. And, um, and the state does have a state statute requiring dogs to be on a leash. So on the trails, on conservation land, people walking without a dog, um, coming upon somebody with a dog can be um, an unpleasant experience for some and can be scary for children if the dog is not well behaved or the owner does not have control. So I'll get to you in a minute, Aaron. So, um, I mean, my dad had me go to dog training when I was 10 years old. And uh, since then, I've trained lots of dogs. But mm -hmm. I, I thought we require, um, if we required that, it might help improve the experience for people on the trails with and without dogs. Yeah, if I could jump in, Alex. So, yeah, you you know, clearly this is, it is a major issue on our trails. I, I would say um, Aaron and others have been working on the update to the Open Space and Recreation Plan, and this is one of the top uh, comments we get. Um, uh, twofold. One, many dog owners uh, enjoy, clearly enjoy uh, using our trails and our conservation land. But um, one of the top concerns that we get uh, as part of our survey work is um, unleashed dogs, out of control dogs, uh, fear of dogs and dogs changing the experience that people have on our trails and in our conservation land. I work very closely with the um, animal welfare uh, uh, officer, uh, Carol Hepburn. Uh, we have uh, multiple bites and multiple negative interactions, multiple, I mean, dozens and dozens of multiple, uh, dozens and dozens of negative interactions every year that she tries to mediate and um, and address. So it's a major problem. There's no question and it has been for years. Um, I think I think your idea is, you know, and I have talked with a few people about it, uh, um, Alex, I think it is possible Um administratively it could be quite challenging to verify that um uh, and i think it would probably have to be part of a town bylaw that that we would require that because it i know there are towns um i might have mentioned this before i believe it was somerville or cambridge did something some years ago where they required uh, you to have uh, some sort of training for your dog if you wanted to take them on conservation land. And Bryony Angus, who was the chair of the CONCOM, was part of that effort uh, when she lived in Cambridge or Somerville. So she said it was very difficult to implement, uh, but people did uh, eventually comply with it and you had to have a certificate. And I think on your dog's collar, it, there was something put on the dog's collar that when you went on conservation land, uh, your dog was under control and I think had to be under voice control at all times. So I'll stop there, but I think it's possible, but it would be a major initiative of the town because it couldn't be selective to just conservation land. It includes town parks like Mill River or Groff Park and town commons like the main common or say Kendrick Park. So yeah. Yep, I recognize that. And yeah. when I thought about the idea, I first thought about just conservation land. And I know hands have been up. Aaron had a hand up. Bruce had a hand up. Yep. Michelle's had a hand up. But if I could just finish with answering Dave, I did include there that to register a dog, they would have to provide a certificate of completion. And so just like they have to provide a rabies certificate. So from an administrative standpoint, it's a no brainer. They either have the certificate or they don't. 
and a dog has to be licensed. And if not, if it's running around without a license, then that's an issue for Carol Hepburn. Um, um, so my question was, is this dead on arrival and we shouldn't talk about it anymore? Or is it possible to um, further this idea? That's all, not can it be done, but is it worth, is it worth advancing? Well, Matt, I, I would love to hear from Aaron and Michelle. I, I would say that in my mind, this is a long-term endeavor. And I'm also interested in, are there any short-term things that we could implement had, very quickly? I had that, some ideas yeah. on that, but I didn't mention them. One is um, trails closed to dogs versus trails open to dogs so that people can choose to go someplace where they will not um, interact with the dog. So, Michelle? And I'll get back to Aaron and Bruce, sorry. Michelle, you're on mute. Right. Yeah, Aaron, do you want to go first? I was going to sort of. Um, I was just going to say, you know, we have a town bylaw relative to dogs. So if we're going to add requirements relative to licensing, it would require an update to the town bylaw, which is under the auspices of the, the town council to make those um, decisions. So it might be a little out of our purview to require that um, since it's a requirement under the bylaw, the details with regard to what's required for licensing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out was, because I was just reading it while we were discussing and you guys were talking about it, is that under the town's bylaw, it's actually illegal for dogs to be leashed on public pro unleashed on public property. So it's really interesting because we have like these, you know, um, exceptions where it's actually posted on the property at Amethyst and other locations, but it actually is not consistent with our town bylaw. So I just wanted to point that out as a just a point and of reference. I thought about that too. I chose not to write about that to, today, just be focused on one idea, but there's a, a host of things that need to get settled. I actually was going to write to the attorney general's office citing the law requiring dogs to be on a leash, asking if it was lawful for a town to have designated areas where they're allowed to be off leash. Uh, I haven't done that. Um, Bruce, you had your hand up. My Michelle, question was answered. Okay. Michelle, where are you going to go? Yeah, um, that, well, I just, yeah, when I comment that that's interesting. So when we talk about off leash, we're talking about exceptions to the law. And I just want to note that because that's important. Um, Alex, I think your idea is, is ideal, but I, I do think there'll probably be some equity issues with it. Like I know that having a dog dog's expensive, but for some people, the time and additional expense might be prohibitive. And um, I think we'd get a lot of pushback on it. But regardless, I, you know, I'm not not in support of that, but it doesn't really address the main issue here, which is that people are not following the leash law. And so I want to talk about that before we go above and beyond to even more idealistic things. Um, and I, I think that's what's at issue here is what Dave said, is that there are people with dogs on leash that are getting harassed by off leash dogs when there's not supposed to be off leash dogs. So it doesn't really, I don't know. I think that like starting point is to address the, the issue at hand. I don't, and I don't see it doing that. So I'd like to talk about how to enforce or um, better regulate the the issue at hand. Yeah, I understand. And my bringing this up to Dave isn't to discount what you're talking about, um, Bruce. Just conceptually, what would happen if we went to the other extreme and just said dogs are not allowed on conservation land, period? That's an option. There's lots of options. There's not allowed, um, allowed in some areas, but not others. Um, any agency dealing with multiple use and will consider dogs a use, no dogs, another use. Like for example, um, snowmobilers and, and cross country skiers in Yellowstone Park, that's a, a, a conflict. There's lots, lots of conflicts involved in multiple use of land and there's always solutions. So we can we can spend some time yeah. coming up with options. The easy one is no dogs. Um, I'll be honest. I I 
I'll be one that pushes back because there's a lot of people who do follow the rules and it would be a shame if a few spoilers ruined it for everybody else. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, I mean, personally, I love the idea of having a place with no dogs because that means there's a lot more birds and wildlife and vegetation and those places like Mass Audubon sanctuaries are are beautiful because of it, honestly. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it's people's sort of right to be able to go where they're close to. And I wouldn't want to, if someone has a dog and they need to take the dog for a walk and they live right next to like Wentworth Farm, like, and having no dogs there, it just doesn't necessarily seem fair to say you can't access the place in your own neighborhood. So I don't, I don't know. I don't have a good vision of what would be off limits to dogs and what would be on limits to dogs, or there's a certain places that would be well suited to a no dog rule that aren't around residences as much. Bruce. No, I just, I got my answer. Thank you. Dave. No, I, I, I kind of like where this conversation is going. I, I'd like, I, I know we won't have time today, but I'd like to explore it more. Um, I do agree. And, and I've been through what we, what we've called, I've been through one of the dog wars. We've had two of these in the last 25 years. I, I was only here for one of them where we, we tried to regulate more closely regulate dogs. And it was a very controversial issue I remember one one or two very extremely uh, tense and and um, uncomfortable and uncivil meetings in the town room where we had over a hundred people jam that room, mostly against the commission regulating dogs more on conservation land. That is not to say I wouldn't be up for it again. Going back to something Michelle said a minute ago, you know uh, about and and Alex, you know. I, I believe people should have the right to have dogs on leash on most of our conservation lands. I think where most of the conflict arises is off leash dogs. I, I don't believe that is a right to have your dog off leash on conservation land. I think that that is where we run into the most problems with dog people interactions, dog dog interactions, bites and and the um the impact it has on your experience when you go out i part of me intellectually loves the idea michelle of saying what if we said these five areas were no dog like i'm thinking atkins flats what, what about those the most ecologically sensitive areas we have part of me you know just goes wow wouldn't it be great Again, I hear you like, what if you live next to Atkins Flats and you want to go walk your dog there? But anyway, so I guess what I'm saying is I think we could own our our regulations. I think we could up our, 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 our signage, our publicity. I think we could do a campaign that might help us to move people more toward using our areas with dogs on leash. I think most of the problem arises with off-leash dogs. My last point is Mass Audubon did this, what, 15 years ago? They, they said no more dogs for ecological reasons primarily. And none of us can doubt the, 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 the quality of, of the, the ecological integrity of their lands because they did that. Secondly, I am always intrigued when I go to the Conti Refuge. I've said this before over in Hadley. And all dogs are on leash. You come over to Hickory Ridge where it clearly says all dogs must be on leash and nobody gives a damn. So there you have it. There is the conundrum, right? At a U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, facility just over the Hadley line where you never, I i don't think I've ever seen a staff person on the trails there. Everybody has their dogs on leash. Everybody picks up their poop, their dog's poop. Um, but you come over to the Amherst side and it's a free for all. <laughs> I don't I'll know if that's necessarily there. true. We've had some close calls with children stepping and falling in. Oh, well, there, maybe but... a little poop, but there I've never <laughs> seen an off leash dog over there. So, so I think we can make some progress. I really do. So uh, I'll call on Bruce in just a second, just a comment in terms of alternatives because of the controversy, um, the extreme solutions probably aren't going to work. Uh, mm -hmm. Something's got to be, we got to, do something closer to the middle 
-hmm. And um, maybe one of the chores we can do in this call is just brainstorm alternatives so that we can think about what to talk about. Bruce? I think that'd be great. Brainstorming, yep. I was getting, moving towards Dave's idea of, my question was related to what Dave then said, which is how effective are these finer grain detail? You have some places that it's okay and other places it's not okay. And and some parts of one trail and not parts of another trail. And, and now you're telling me that there's whole sections of, at least a new conservation area where people are completely ignoring it all. And I, I worry that if it's not really, if it's too detailed, it's too heterogeneous, that no one will pay any, that they, they can't grasp it all and the signs aren't enough. That's my concern. Can I quickly respond to that, Alex? I, I, to I, to I, to I totally agree with you. Some years ago, the former commission and former directors of conservation and staff decided to focus their efforts on Amethyst Brook and Lower Mill River between Puffers Pond and Mill River Recreation Area. They specifically made those two areas off leash. And this is where we got into this fine grain before 10 a.m., right? All other areas, there was no compromise in all the other conservation areas around town. Dogs must be on leash in those other areas. Unfortunately, over time, because we don't have a high enough presence, either through this to bar through conservation or through the uh, animal welfare uh, officer, because we don't have enough presence on the trails, there's been an erosion of that norm. And the best example Michelle brought up a minute ago, Wentworth Farm. When I started here, there were very few dog walkers at Wentworth Farm. Now, it is the de facto alternative to Amethyst Brook, many off-leash dogs. The last thing I'll say is be careful too what we do in terms of management and there are consequences. I'll give you an example, Podick and Catherine Cole. Podick and Catherine Cole were now have now been discovered by dog walkers because we elevated the profile of those conservation areas through the work we did with the Castrol Trust. And I've had spirited conversations with Kristen DeBoer over this. We created parking there, new signage, updated the trails. And now that has become a big time dog walking area where historically there was virtually no dogs. So I'm just saying we have to be careful in our promotion and our quote improvements. Those can sometimes have unintended consequences. So anyway, just food for thought. Michelle? I just want to second something. So I agree, Alex, that we can't go extreme and that it has to be somewhere in the middle. And with Bruce, that it can't be too fine grained. It's something Dave just said, but I already forgot. <laughs> um, I just I just wanted to throw some things out there because I think about this a lot. But I I think investing in signage and trying to sort of nip some things in the bud right now, like Wentworth and and Hickory Ridge, especially Hickory Ridge, because it is ecologically sensitive. Um but bigger signs and like explanatory signs. And I've communicated with some dog walkers about like people think that you're supposed to pick up your dog poop so people don't step in it. So they don't really connect like the runoff factor because all these places are always near water. And like ha there's a sign at Mill River um, across from Puffer's Pond on that trail where it has like a dog pooping and the watershed. It has like a an educational sign basically I don't always believe that educating people makes them behave better, but at least they have a different piece of information that it's, oh, it's, you know, bigger than me. It's not just my dog's poop and someone stepping in it. So I I guess like I know that signs are vandalized. I think, yeah, having clear definition between what the exceptions are. Oh, Dave, I like the idea of campaigning and having a more like public outreach to this. Um, but I think like big signs <laughs> and not just like nice wooden signs, but like really in your face so that the people that have the dog there are sort of held accountable to the other people, all their public on the trail. Like they can't pretend they walked by it and didn't see it basically. Um, 
So that was a lot, but I also just wanted to uh, follow up with what Dave said. Um, my idea about the dog licensing was that there'd be just like a checkbox, which is I like read and understand and hereby acknowledge that the only off-leash dog places are these locations at this time and they have to check it to like get their dog license. So that could, a lot of people when they are confronted about the off-leash dog, they say they didn't know. So at least is another layer of accountability and dissemination of information where people have to look and see and acknowledge what the leash laws are. So I, that's an easy one to me. It's just some words on paper and they check the box. And I, I feel like that's sort of a low effort one. Um, so that and signage and, and doing something fairly quickly because people are getting more, people have a lot of dogs. They have lots of dogs after 2020 <laughs> and, um, they like to walk their dogs off leash and the more it becomes habitual and it's enculturated and everybody's doing it and people start seeing it. I, I just, we're going, we're going downhill fast with like having any kind of reins on this. So that's all. Thanks. Uh, Bruce, and then I have a response. Um, so I'm looking at the other end, the enforcement end. So what happened in this scenario, what should be done? I'm out walking on a trail and I see an off leash dog. As a conservation commissioner, can I, should I confront the owner? Do I hold up my phone and say, you know, I'm calling the police because this is, un this is unacceptable, it's illegal. Or I'm calling Dave, or I'm calling the dog officer, I forget her name. Um, or, or, you somebody, or, or you take a picture of them. I can do that. But how aggressive do we get when we're out there? That's one question. But how aggressive generally should the enforcement be so that people realize, oh, the police might actually come to give me a hard time about my off-leash dog? I don't have a dog. So I, I'm kind of not agnostic. I'm just not the right person to engage in this. But... I, I wonder what I should do in that situation. Can I can I jump in, Alex? Yeah. I would have them call Erin. She's very good with these situations. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I think I I think these are great questions. Um, specifically to to your scenario, Bruce. Um, it is well within your purview as a conservation commission member when you're out on conservation land to educate the public. You know, you see somebody cutting down a tree, starting a campfire, um, have an off-leash dog, uh, spray painting trees, whatever. I, I was once up on the Mount Holyoke Range and there was somebody coming down with a wheel on our town conservation land, coming down with a wheelbarrow full of rocks. And I said, what are you doing? They said, oh, I need these for my um, rock garden at home. And I said, I introduced myself and I said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take that those rocks and you're going to take them back and you're going to throw them out in the woods where you found them. So anyway, I think you all have a, um, um, you, you have the ability to educate. I would caution you a little bit about confrontation, calling the police, things of that sort. I, I think if we're, the police, frankly, if the police came, I think they wouldn't know what to do because we need to elevate and educate and raise awareness about this issue in town mm -hmm. as part of a campaign. And I think I think that's a takeaway from this is that we need to we need to educate people. We also need to remember it's not only Amherst residents who are using our trails and our conservation lands. It's people well, from that. all all the surrounding towns. We are kind of a mecca for that because we have 80 miles of trails in Puffer's Pond and Mount Pollux, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think by all means, introducing yourself, Bruce, and saying, hi, I'm a member of the Conservation Commission. I live in town. You know, our job is to uh, help manage this area. Did you know that X, whatever that person might be doing? And open a dialogue with them. You'll learn a lot and and you may change somebody's mind or they may tell you to F off. And, and that's happened to me many times. Um, so um, I think it's a little bit of a crapshoot and, and you just got to be a little careful out there as to who you're interacting with and just use use common sense. But you certainly can educate them and and learn from them. What, what is it um, that 
that they're doing and why do they think they can do it? Um, I like the idea of doing some immediate things to Michelle's earlier points. I do think we can, we can quickly turn around more signage and even kind of large. And you know, one of the reasons Brad Borderwick, our land manager has those huge signs, which I don't love they're routed, but they're like, gosh, they're four and a half feet long or something. And they say, dogs must be on leash, yada, yada, yada. Brad made them big and he made them so, he attaches them so well that people can't steal them and break them and destroy them because that's what many dog owners have done historically to our smaller signs. So they got to be robust. Oh, can we have some badges, Dave? <laughs> uh, <you> know. <laughs> um. I, yeah, I, I'm trying to think because enforcement is an issue and I really don't want to not do things because there isn't enforcement. I, I don't like giving up because of that because we'll always end up giving up because of that. Um, and so maybe because this is not this this is not a new problem. And I the Pelham Conservation Commission, and I've reached out and didn't hear anything back, has dealt with it recently. And they went through some iterations at Buffum Falls. And I think they had like a, a number to call and they ended up taking that sign down. And I'm not sure why, but I think there is some learning for them. So it might be worth, I'll, I'll try and get in touch with them again. But if anybody knows anybody on that commission and can contact them, um, try that too. Um, but I- what, I Sorry, I, what town? Pelham. Pelham, okay. So specifically the Buffum Falls area, because they have a problem there. And I guess they put up a new sign and it was like first offense. And there was a there was a fine, second offense, fine. And it, it got big. It was like five hundred dollars or like losing access or something for the third offense. And it seemed to at least have some effect for a time, but that sign's gone either because someone stole it or because they couldn't keep up with it administratively. I'm not sure. Um but I, I do want to think about also like trying to have cultural shifts for this, because like you're saying, Bruce, like if you're on the trail and you're voicing, hey, you're you know, there's a reason for these laws. Like, can you please put your dog on a leash? Um, and enough people start like accepting that as the norm instead of having an off leash dog as a norm, then maybe we can like shift towards what's socially acceptable and really, I feel like that's going to be like the strongest way to go about this. Not like, you know, we can't have Carol out there for every single call. Like that's impossible. So like if we could like somehow do some PR, I know we have a new PR person, like um, somehow mm -hmm. start getting the word out so that people know and that uh, people call people on bad behavior, just, you know, their community members are out. Um and then also like back to Bruce's point, like it's it's very awkward and challenging to confront people on the trail. And usually if I'm with my kids, I say, you know, I use them as a reason. But if it's just me and I don't like seeing the dogs, you know, running through a meadow with nesting birds, chasing animals and digging holes, which is always the case, like people don't like hearing their dog as being bad. They just can't hear it. <laughs> and so there's like words that reach people better. And on our preserves, we we have dealt with this and there's, you know, phrases and ways to go about it that work better than others. Like, hey, beautiful dog. <laughs> Did you know? Something like that. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe the uh maybe there's some staff on hand that you guys can talk to that have some good ways that would be part of the campaign to give people a tool other than just blatant confrontation to to um to approach people about not having a, their dog off leash so Thank anyway you. cultural shift yeah Aaron. Aaron. so i just had some um kind of key points that I thought were really important from the conversation. The first is people not picking up dog poop, I think is the number one issue from where I sit, which it's not just on conservation lands. It's everywhere. I just saw somebody on the town common let their dog poop and walk right by it. You know, it happens everywhere. And it's an equal problem in places like that because when it rains, the, it washes right into a catch basin and goes right down to the Faring Brook. Um, so even if it's if it's off our conservation yeah. land, ultimately it's going downstream. So I do think that there are benefits to educating people and signage and not just on conservation land, but everywhere. 
Um, but I think sort of my key issues were issues with poop, you know, and water quality are really important. Um, that dogs must be leashed or under control. So, you know, even if they are off leash during those hours at Puffers or at, um, excuse me, Mill River or Amethyst Brook, they still have to be under control. Um, and that's, you know, on the, on the dog owner. Um, but that's a really key point. The other thing is it's illegal for um, dogs to harass wildlife. And so it might be important for people to know that that's not okay. Um, unless of course they're, they're hunting and they have a license and, you know, uh, a hunting dog. Um, but for me, like the number one issue is safety um, that, you know, if somebody was to be threatened or hurt. Um, and so, you know, these, these kind of key issues, I think, are what are at stake from the discussion. Um, and I do think that signage and bags would be a really effective approach. And I think education would be a really effective approach, even if we do nothing to change the current rules. Thank you. Somebody took down my, uh, my hand, which I had raised. When I was trying to talk, it, it switched our position on the screen, and I think I was trying to unmute myself, and I may have done that inadvertently. Okay, I got a couple of points. Um, I we have we talked earlier about trying to jot down some alternatives. I'm talking about bullets, and um, I have not been doing it. It's it's I'm not a good note taker. I. It's difficult for me sometimes to listen, participate, and take notes. So if if folks could jot down the title for an idea as we maybe we'll get into, I'd like to get into a round very soon where all we're doing is listing the title of an alternative so we can write it down for future discussion. That's that's one point. Second, water quality and poop. There's going to be pushback on that one, and I'll be the first. Every fish poops in the river. Beavers only poop in the river. Every deer, raccoon, mink, every wildlife poops on the ground and doesn't pick it up. It all deteriorates and becomes part of the system to claim that somehow dogs are going to, are going to be a cause of pollution is not to me as good an, uh, a reason as safety. And uh, I see Michelle's hand firing right up and I understand she's gonna respond. But to me, safety uh, of, of others on the trails is much more uh, understandable by the public than water quality. And so I would advise that, that um, uh, that safety be a strong um, um, reason, S -s -s safety of other users, safety and courtesy of other users. Um, so if somebody could be jotting down our ideas when we get into a round of just simply listing titles, I would greatly appreciate it. Michelle? You're on mute. I just want to respond to the water quality issue. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it because there's published studies about this, but just while the beavers are pooping, nothing comes close to the density and amount and concentration of dogs walking along a trail. I mean, not only that, but they carry different kinds of diseases that are unaccountable for. But regardless of that, it's a completely artificial input to any kind of system to have like 200 dogs or even 50 dogs or even 20 dogs pooping along a trail in a concentrated place every single day like one beaver in a pond or five beavers in a pond isn't different but anyway there's been studies in urban areas and suburban areas testing areas around places where dogs go and the adjacent water and they have found increases in different kinds of um pathogens and things carried by dogs and E. coli, whatever else is in it. And it's urine too. So, so anyway, I just, there's evidence to show that it is impactful to water quality. And I don't, I think we should take 
all the avenues, um, whatever speaks to any one person, we won't know. But when I've confronted people about their dogs with my children, their first response and always when an off-leash dog is running up to us, always at Wentworth, it seems like everyone says, oh, don't worry, he's friendly. He's a good dog. Don't worry. And and they still are wet and they jump on my kids. And so there's a lot of ways that a friendly dog can hurt a small child. And some people have told us that dogs are friendly and then we've seen it like attack another dog or just jump on a kid and scratch them. I mean, my kids have left in tears all the time from friendly dogs off leash. And I'm sorry my voice is getting raised, but it's very, very frustrating because it feels like a place that I don't go anymore because I can't trust that my kids will be safe there. And that is completely not fair to people. Um, so how do, you, how do you really feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love dogs and I love animals, but I also just feel like people need to act respectfully to the rest of the community. And like, to me, that's what it comes down to. And then following that, you know, these are conservation lands. So both okay. of those things are near and dear to my heart. And yeah, that's how I feel about it. So I, I will tell you that I, um, when I, I head east a lot, uh, going up through Pelham, and I'm often going by Amethyst Brook parking lot at 7 in the morning, 6.30, 8, 8.30, and I normally count around 15 to 17 cars there. And I, I don't stop and ask people, are you walking your dog? But that's pretty early. And... Um, um, I have to assume that a large portion of those people are walking their dog. When I've gone down to uh, walk on Amethyst Brook, occasionally I have asked people walking who don't have a dog if it bothers them to have dogs off leash. And most people say no, so long as they don't, so long as they behave themselves. I have uh, seen poop on the side of the road that hasn't been picked up. And I was sorry to see that there is I think there are bags provided at the head of the trail by the parking lot. And um, um, so I'll just end there. If so, if, and Dave has his hand up, but when Dave gets done, I, I would ask the group if we could begin a session where we simply name the title of alternatives for us to consider so that we can have a working list. Dave? Yeah, no, I can you hear me? I yes. just no, I would want to reiterate. I think this is a great brainstorming session. And I I acknowledge, uh, just want to acknowledge Aaron and uh and Michelle's, you know, focus on on um on water quality as well. But what I'm taking away from kind of my perch is I, I keep coming back to a campaign. We need to raise awareness about these issues in town broadly, but more specifically on trails. And many of our recreation areas are connected to trails. So I don't see how we can separate the two and we we shouldn't. Um, could, you, could you give it a title so we can write it down? Create a campaign to raise awareness about off-leash dog campaign. issues or something let's, like that. Let's just call yeah. it awareness campaign. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I also wrote down this phrase, um, <laughs> Not that we're trying to beat them, but we can't beat them. I would hazard a guess, and I, it's not going out very far on a limb. I would guess that the number one use of our conservation trails is dog walking. If you actually had a counter, a meter, whatever. So we are we need to get the dog owners on board with us. How do we do that as part of this campaign? And I think safety, I think the safety of others, safety of children, safety of of seniors, you know, in 20 years, I'm not going to go into it, but I've heard from more seniors, more parents with young children, just like Michelle, they won't go to areas anymore. And Wentworth is probably the number one. Wentworth is a beautiful area with extensive trails and lots to see and do, but um, a lot of people won't go there anymore. So safety of people, safety of the other dogs. And I think we can work in the water quality as passionate as Aaron and most of us are about water quality. Uh, and protecting wetlands and and resources, the average person isn't as um, passionate, let's say. But if we can make the connection between concentrated dog poop uh, waste and water quality in the Amethyst Brook and the Fort River and the Mill River, I think that's the hook. 
right? Because people want to wade in. They don't want to see signs that uh, jump bridge that say terrible water quality. Don't go in. You, they don't want to see a sign. I, I want to put up a sign at Groff Park and say, I wouldn't take my kids in, you know, in, in the Fort River at Groff Park. I probably wouldn't because the water quality is not good. I'm not saying it's all on dogs, but uh, dogs definitely, it's not Alex, but I, uh, uh, you know, Michelle made a very good point. The concentration say at Amethyst Brook of dog waste is off the charts. So it's definitely a contributing factor. Um, there's, yeah, you, if, so you I, had, if you had no dogs allowed around Puffer's Pond or the trail, the, the handicap trail, I, I, I'll I bet you that puffers would still not meet water quality requirements. You're probably right. But again, I think we can also work in a quality of experience there in our campaign. Yeah. Nobody okay. likes to step in dog waste and nobody gonna... wants their kid. So thanks. So, anyway. so we have a title. I called it awareness campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, we won't have any problems understanding what that means. I just put down safety of others, including kids. Michelle, I don't know who was first. Oh, we should probably have dog somewhere in the title, like dog use on conservation lands awareness campaign, um, something explanatory. But so Alex, I was just gonna ask because, because you keep saying alternatives, like are we discussing alternatives? Because from my point of view, I'm not necessarily advocating we change the rules. I'm just, my position right now is like trying to get compliance with the rules that are in place. And, and I guess that's where I would want to put energy. I don't, I don't want to take anything away from anybody, but I want them to follow the rules in place. So I don't know, you keep calling it alternatives, but I, I'm just saying I wouldn't necessarily call it an alternative. And I just want to interject something about Amethyst Brook. I went there at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock with a couple families. And what happens is that there's the on-leash sign. So people walk their dog on leash. And as soon as they get to the forest, they look around, they take their dog off leash. And I saw that with 99%. So like six out of seven people that went there and they wait for us to like yell at them or something. And then we don't, they just walk their dog off leash or they look around and see if other people are doing it. But it, it it's like moot. <laughs> I think we just need in your face messaging and from all sorts of angles. Okay, thanks. Um, with regard to alternatives, I'm not gonna get tangled around the axle about what words we're using. I'm trying to focus future discussion um, on a range of what we can do to better the situation, whether it's, I call it alternatives, enhance enforcement of the current rules. I don't really care what we call it. What I wanna do is focus our, our attention in the future on solutions. Um, so I sort of assume when we talk about awareness campaign that we're talking about dogs. <clears throat> we can add something to that. I'll just put dog awareness. Okay, uh, Aaron. I just wanted to say that um you know, I'm working right now with a team in town hall on the open space and recreation plan, and I'll absolutely integrate um, these comments into the open space and recreation plan in terms of um, needs. And so like the need for um, <clears throat> signage and the need for addressing water quality, um, I think those are really important action items that we can directly integrate and potentially make the town eligible for some funding to address it um, because that's one of the biggest things this hinges on to me we can say we want a campaign but if we're going to put up a bunch of signs where how are we going to pay for it um, so I think getting it into a plan that we can actually um, uh, execute and get and get funding for um, that would be awesome I just wanted to share one other thing which is um, these there was two different um, questions where the number one concerns of um, trail users were asked on the open space and recreation plan. And this is the response responses. So um, there was two questions and on both of them, off leash dogs were the number one concern. I just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that that I shared it. Not I don't I don't have any vendetta. I have a dog. <laughs> so um, I just want to share what the respondent said. Well, that's the data right there. 
Yeah, can you send us that, Aaron? It's in your packets for today's meeting, um, but yeah, certainly can. Um, I didn't see it. I'll go get it there. Don't bother sending it. Um, so I put integrating needs into open space. I hope I'm not the only one keeping a list. Um, Bruce, are you done, Aaron? Your hand's still up. Yep, I'm sharing, so I've got to move a couple screens to get there. I'm there now. Bruce? So um, some of these signage improvements is one title that I heard. The campaign is a different title. Maybe um, there is Alex's original idea of having people required to um, have proof of dog training to get a license. That may, given this discussion, that is possibly out there too far from the center. But I would, I think we should leave it in for now, and because it was the starting point. And then I had two other, uh, a question and an idea, very quickly. Question, very with a just a quick answer. Do we have dog parks, and is it possible to have more of them? Yes, we have. Yeah, that's okay. So there's my hand. My hand is wait. It's up okay. in the right spot here. All right, that's all. I wanted. Um, there are yes, some. we we have one dog park. It is very expensive to create dog parks. Right. I don't suspect we'll have and, another one in the near future. And not in my backyard is a th a real thing. Okay, and then finally, when I was listening to Alex talk about driving by the Amethyst Brook parking lot, I think anyway at a certain time of day. All of a sudden, I had an image of myself doing fishing surveys. And I realized as part of a campaign, one could have a teams of surveyors out there at the relevant times asking people about how they uh, uh, use the dog in the conservation area. And it, be, it can be an educative thing and it could gather data about, assuming they didn't lie. Of course, Alex knows that anglers never exaggerate or lie. So you have excellent data. I don't know about dog walkers, but anyway, so that's my idea. Thank you. So I put down survey dog use. Yep, that's it. Is it dog use or dog survey dog users? Dog, you're yeah, the dog users, the dog owners, the dog walkers, the whatever. Can we also add to the list? My idea about the acknowledgement of the town leash laws on the dog licensing. Good. Oh, yes, yeah. I like that one too. That's that's low hanging fruit. That should be very yeah. easy. Because from this conversation, it sounds like there aren't very many fruits that are within our easy grasp. And how many? Oh, man, it is low hanging man. fruit. I think it's an excellent idea. But I'm reminded that most people, when they check off, yes, I've read the policies, um, when they <laughs> do something, they never read them. They just check the box. Well, there you go. But there's no reason not to do it, particularly if the person handing out the license actually gives them the piece of paper. And and um, that's kind of like getting the HIPAA notice when you go to the doctor. Right. I'm asked to sign the HIPAA form. And I said, no, I'm not going to sign it because you haven't actually given me your HIPAA policy. Then they say, go to our website. And I said, no, you're asking me to sign this form now. <laughs> um, anyway, Michelle, go ahead. I have noted acknowledgement of what? Existing dog the, laws? Or? Yeah, the Amherst dog leash laws. And I think it should include in bullet point form, the location and times of allowable off leash. Um, it, I mean, I feel like one sentence with those two bullet points is is enough not to you know space out and just check the box. But it, it it's not just to disseminate the information though. That is a big part of it. But also because I think Dave has said like people say, oh, I didn't know, or like you know like this is a point at which they have checked a box of accountability and so they did know and that's just like um you know anyway accountability um i just wanted to have a offhand comment to bruce about the the dog parks um 
since you're not a dog owner, a lot of people don't consider them to be an alternative to off leash mm -hmm. dog walking. So, and or okay. dogs, yeah, their dogs don't do well in it, or they don't like the pea gravel. It, it it's not like apples to apples. So, I I know it was supposed to relieve a lot of the burden on other places, but that's just some feedback. Yeah. Nice. I'm sure there's fine grain detail about them. I just know they exist. Yeah. Okay. So, um, any other titles that people want to suggest? Aaron, did you have a title? No, but I have a comment or question for Dave when it's appropriate. Can I finish? Okay. So I have a list. And maybe Aaron's got some notes. Maybe all of you have some notes. How about if I type up my list and send it to all of you? It won't be perfect. It's simply a starting place. And I ask that you make it better um, just to get, the, get a list and um, for us to work from. And um, I'm not going to be too fussy about the words. The concept's more important. Um, and I'm not going to put a whole lot of details under each one on what they what they involve. I don't want to produce something. I want to produce something that's a half a page long. Just, you know, five or six words for a title. And uh, so we don't forget some. And so it can help focus uh, our uh, discussion because dogs needs to attend, needs to finish. Aaron. I was just going to ask Dave. Um relative to the town's bylaw, dog bylaw, and our policy or the, you know, historic policy of allowing off-leash dogs at conservation lands, um, had, I guess, how did that come into being? And was there ever any sort of contextual discussion about the fact that those allowances are are conflicting with the town bylaw and like how um if there's ever been any discussion of that or any issues raised about that or conflicts and or like or ha have we just sort of not um not dealt with it or um i think it's a great question aaron it predates me so amethyst brook and um Amethyst Brook and Lower Mill Oops. River were decided upon before I got here. So that's more than 20 years ago. I think in more recent, call it 10 to 14 years ago, whenever the second set of dog, I, I only have been here through one of the quote dog wars where we we touched the third rail, we touched these and psh, it, it regulations blew up in our face. So we we didn't get very far looking at the possible conflict between what the commission says and the town bylaw. I would I'm not a lawyer, but I would argue that the town bylaw should trump what the conservation commission says about the the two areas in question. But I think that's the short answer is nobody wanted to touch it because it got too hot. While I, I have the yeah. While I, I have the. I would yeah. suggest we follow suit for the time being. Yeah. Can I add two things since my hand was up, Alex? Yes. Let, if Aaron is done, if Aaron is completed. Yeah. You good? Well, I did have a follow up, which is yeah. how it's been dealt with relative to enforcement, which is to say, let's say uh, somebody's been bitten by a dog at Mill River during the off leash hours. I mean, I'm just hypothetical, and the police or the dog officer arrives and how is that done relative to enforcement? Is it, oh, this is allowed here, so it's okay? Or is it, no, this is against the town bylaw, you're getting a ticket? Do you know? Um, I don't know specifically, Erin, but from my many, many interactions with, with um, Carol Hepburn, um, I, I think it really comes down to every situation is different. And Carol... Carol is an amazing mediator, so I think um, she mediates. Sometimes I, I've said in private conversations, just 
I have a little concern about how many situations we mediate because we, you know, we need to know the data, how many people are bitten, how many people are accosted on our trails, how many interactions does Carol have? We could easily invite her to one of these conversations and she would come. She would tell you it consumes a lot of her time dealing with dog uh, issues. I will share with you that my mom was bitten at Mill River Recreation Area. The dog was not found and my mom actually had to go through the rabies shots because the dog was not found until much later but we had to be safe so she had a large out-of-pocket expense to get the rabies shot so it happened so i don't think in my in my experience Aaron, there's i'm not aware that anyone has ever been fined i'm sure that lawyers have been involved and other similar type processes but i would um, i would like to add if i could um it's never okay for a dog to bite a person regardless of of rules a dog mm -hmm. can be put to sleep yeah. for biting somebody absolutely and um i was i went up to um <laughs> the blacksmith in uh, williamsburg to pick up some stuff he was making for me and his dog bit me in the hand and wouldn't let go. I had to pull my hand out of his mouth. And I had blood. And I said, your dog bit me. And he goes, oh, that's unusual. He's a good dog. And I, I could have called the police. I didn't. But um, dogs bite people. So um, I still got the marks on my hand. Um, <clears throat> Can I, Alex, I just, before I was responding to Aaron, just two quick things. I think one of our bullets or somehow there's an opportunity here for collaboration. There are other organizations within town we can collaborate with on these initiatives like the Recreation Commission. They have very similar concerns about all of our recreation areas. Um, uh, DPW has to deal with dogs because they manage uh, our, our parks and recreation areas in common. So I think there's an opportunity for, for collaboration uh, in many ways on, on these things. The other thing I will just share something that Michelle said made me think of what I've heard from many dog owners and and I am not currently a dog owner, but uh, my family has dogs, is the ex quote experience of dogs off leash in nature is very important to dog owners. That experience, there is something that many dog owners feel is magical about having dogs off leash. Michelle mentioned the dog park. Uh, that was a project that I worked very hard on. Our hope was that it would take some pressure off the trails. I'm not sure it really has. It's a, as Michelle noted, it's a different kind of experience to be in a dog park. Many people like it because they can quote control their dog within the fence lines, but many people don't like it because they like that experience of their dogs off leash in a forest, in a field. Um, so anyway, all great stuff. And I, I've enjoyed dog, this conversation. Yeah. At the dog park, Dave, having two pens is useful, uh, particularly for do owners of d small dogs. They can go into the pen for small dogs and not worry about the big dogs. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the small dog owners enjoy the, are a group that do enjoy the dog park. Um, I understand the larger dogs, um, uh, the owners of larger dogs having concerns about, about that, but anyways. Um, I'm sorry. I've seen a, a band of corgis um, gang up on a Malmute and just take him out. So it moves both ways. <laughs> so um, we have 12. We're going to end at 1 o'clock out of courtesy to everybody. And uh, we do have time to, to uh, add any more titles. Um, we don't have to have a complete list, and I have volunteered <laughs> to type it up and send it out. And if you would, um, if you could, um, um, if we could agree on when we would provide comments back, I would suggest uh, by next Sunday night, so that uh, we have a time to consolidate everybody's thoughts into one list and get it out before our next meeting. And so I um, like some feedback That's on fine. 
whether we can agree on close whenever you go to bed by on Sunday, uh, review the list and provide uh, uh, feedback. I know Aaron will be off work as of the end of Friday. Dave works all the time. So uh, Aaron, Aaron works around the clock. I will tell you. She well, let's not add to it. Okay. No, we don't we don't want anybody doing work. Is there any the reason that, that Alex can't receive the feedback, revise the document, and send it out to all of us? Is there is that against some uh protocol here? Oh Jesus, don't go. We're not deliberating. Yeah, Michelle, was that what you were gonna say? You're on mute. Can we have a Google Doc? Um, that's deliberation. Okay. How have I don't we think, done? Don't how think, have, yeah, how have we done this? I was just going to say, I don't think we're developing a list. I don't think is deliberation. Nobody's expressing an opinion. Yeah, I Aaron, mean, this isn't a policy remember. that we're developing. It's really like a kind of brainstorming of ideas. Um, I mean, I would suggest, Alex, how about everybody writes their notes down and sends it to me, and then I can try to consolidate it into one list and integrate mine. Yeah, I was trying to save you work. <clears throat> well, the question is the timing. So if if we get it to you by Sunday night, it'll be sitting there at your desk on Monday, and it's easy to take 10 or 15 minutes to consolidate it and send it back to us. Is that what Alex intended? Yes. yes. I think that's the safer way with open meeting right. law. Fine. I withdraw my suggestion. OK. With that, um, Aaron, can you tell me if any members of the public are with us? And if they are, ask for their comments. No members. There's no attendees. Nobody there. Yeah, I can't see that. Alex, do we have to discuss the extension or anything else in in preparation for um, our presentation on Wednesday? Not as far as presentation. I'm okay, well, I saw some conversations on email. So yeah, go ahead, Dave. I saw you're going to talk. Can I just ask a practical question around that? And and you know, I've I've I put out that email. Um, and and again, I'm I'm not you know, going to die on this hill about a six month uh, extension. I would just hope that, well, so practically speaking, I guess my question is, how much are we going to get done during July and August? Are people around? Are, are we really, are we really going to meet consistently? And, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some vacation this summer. People are going to be away. I just, you know, part of me wondered, and I was talking a little bit with Aaron, is if we do the six month extension, which gets us what to the end of December, I'm hoping we don't need all of that. But um, could we could we at some point identify everything we have left to do and only that. But then secondly, one of the things that Aaron and I talked about was, is summer are we a going to consistently meet because all of us have busy lives outside of this important work, but B if Aaron and I had a little time around the edges during July and say the first part of August, we could work on some of the associated documentation and mapping that goes with the work we're doing. And so I was just looking for a little maybe breathing room around that to say, you know, how frequently do we need to meet during the summer if we weren't having this meeting every week or every other week? that would give us a little more breathing room to develop some of those, you know, those maps of all the areas that we currently manage for early successional habitat and anything and, and other associated maps around that, for instance. So that's all, um, I guess that's a, a big statement, but just asking you all, you know, what's your crystal ball tell us about the summer? Is there, you Bruce. know, so my question is, how problematic is it for you, Dave and Aaron, to, if you can't meet with us, so we go ahead and meet, and keep working? You you can. We we just we just enjoy. I don't want to speak to Aaron, but we enjoy these conversations. We think we have a lot to offer. 
because we're the ones who are staff out there, you know, trying to practically manage these areas. No, so, I, I know. Yeah. Uh, it was more just me. We can make progress in areas where that input isn't so needed right then. And, you know, there's a list of questions and we, we check in with you later. I, I just, I'm not, this committee should meet. If I, and you met at least once or twice when I couldn't meet and you moved ahead. Mm -hmm. Others, any, any other? Well, I think I was pretty plain in my message back to Dave on that idea. And I, I, if I, if we're not going to meet in the summer, then to me, the six months extension begins on Labor Day. And that goes into the new year, which I don't want to do. I plan to meet as scheduled during the summer. If people can't make it, then we'll make exceptions. But as I said, 30% of the meetings have been canceled. And that's, all for that's, good reason. I mean, that happens, Alex, you know, we're all professional but, and all busy so right but there was the assumption is you got six months why is it going to take you so long well during that period no commission meetings were canceled yeah. so but 30, i guess yeah 30, my own my only response 30, to that 30, is 30 percent of these were canceled so if you want me to push back i'm ready well i would like to see a list of what do we have left to do you know, we have spent a tremendous amount of time on a few things, but not talk like here we are, you know, nobody's fault, but we're talking about dogs now. This is the first time we really have a substantive discussion on dogs when we've spent multiple, multiple, multiple meetings on ag policy and rules and regs. I would just like to see what is left for us to do and then really roll through those remaining topics. Okay, so... Um, I, I don't know what's on the list. I, I heard I mean, beavers, dogs, it. hunting, camping, and climate change, I know is still on our list. If those I are the know. things we have left to do, let's put them out there. And Let me work and, with Aaron for the next meeting, and we'll come up with a list. That would be helpful, I think, for yeah, everybody. I, um, I think the job of this subcommittee became much more complex than it was anticipated when we were formed. And... I think what, what Dave would really like is a management plan for conservation so that he can point to a document saying, you know, we need to manage grassland species and mow this often. Here it is in the document. And I don't think that was necessarily envisioned at that depth when we first got going. We've listened to Dave and we've tried to move in that direction, which is why I think agriculture took so long. It Agriculture took um well it's all documented at the top of the of the of the document when we worked on it but we were diligent and um tried to go in the direction that dave asked but that that added to our mission michelle um i think that your plan dave would be helpful for something like uh the climate change portion um I feel like I would really, I, I do really feel like the dog's issue needs to be addressed more quickly. So mostly if there were like big signs that went up really soon, I'd be happy about it, but um, it's just going to get worse over the summer. That's all my only concern. I don't really have like a, a strong opinion about how we proceed. Um, I'll miss some summer also, but that's all. If I could, no, I totally hear you, but I, I do want us to still focus on um, our focus in this group should really be on the writing and not the implementation. Like we don't have to solve the dog problem this summer, or frankly, we don't really have to solve it. The, the purpose of this committee was not to solve it. It was so, so the dog section should outline, you know, what steps are we going to take to, address some of the issues we've identified. But I guess it's less about implementation than it is about writing and saying, are our dog policies, this was, this committee is should be about policy, not about implementation. So if you, if you give us, if we write, if together we come up with the policy that the commission accepts, then we can move forward with the implementation of that policy. That's all I'm, I'm I guess I'm, re-emphasizing the focus on policy. 
Yeah. Well, Dave, you called me last August to have this conversation while I was on vacation. And um, I think we've always tried to uh, address policy. We're not in the business of implementing or administering conservation lands that falls to the department. Um, so I think um, I see your hand, Bruce, in a minute. Um, I and Michelle, I'll get together with Aaron and come up with what's left. Um, my gut feeling is that the document should be a standalone document, explain itself, that can be on the web and um, anybody can pick it up and read it. So I think we, we're moving in that direction. And I like the idea of handing things to the larger commission as we finish them to speed up getting to the end point. Bruce? I was just gonna say that the um, agriculture document is a policy document, but it definitely goes in the direction of adding a lot more of the implementation. So having had that experience, I think we should learn from it for the other sections and try to step back a little bit and keep it at the policy level. But it's also true that agriculture but is an arena that's somewhat new. And so it required a lot more discussion. Some of these other topics may not require that. Yeah, and just, just uh, um, with respect to Michelle and Aaron, we don't have any licenses. We don't have any agriculture going on now. We, well, you do have one person that's, that's you do have one person. Anyways, um, mm -hmm. We'll see what the commission does with it. And, and so I, I, one of the reasons I want to go through the summer is because we're handing the commission documents for their review and comment. And so we need time as a group or we assign it to somebody to, to take care of those comments as we're working on additional topics. So um, that's going to take some time too. Um, and then we need to feed back to the, to the larger commission. So when we get done with all of this, we have one document that has essentially been reviewed by the commission. Michelle? I would just say that I defer to this town staff needs and constraints. So um, if you know there's practicality in taking the summer break so that we can be more productive after that, then I'm fine with it. Um, and if we did that, then maybe we could have like some homework research time um, so that it's a little easier to get move forward on things. And I feel like this is a no, I can't do a lot in between these meetings. So if there is some space and some direction to have like more um, more time just to do some research into things, then that could be helpful too. Erin. Um so I got uh tasked with the open space and recreation plan update, which was supposed to be completed at the end of June, but now we are sort of pushing more for July, which is taking one to two days a week out of my time um, here in town hall working on it. Um, also, I, I do feel that we have, I have a list of drafts of the, the um, policy revisions we made to the draft land use policy document, which are have become a little bit scrambled in terms of various sections being updated. Um, and I'd like to have some time to go through those to integrate and create a clean version that it integrates all of our edits since we started meeting about a year ago. Um, I feel like it might be useful for us to see those updates in order to determine what is outstanding relative to the committee's charge. Um, I am going to be away for a week in August. It's not the, it's like the first full week in August from the 5th to the 9th, I believe. Um, so that week I wouldn't be available, but I was just thinking from, from my standpoint, um, if I'm going to dedicate time offline to getting the land use policy sort of um, polished so that we're ready to take another gander at it, that it might be nice to have some time to do that. Um, and when we meet, it does, it does kind of take a chunk of the day for me to prepare and download after. So, um, just suggesting that, um, and 
in terms of like the the management of individual conservation lands, I had sort of envisioned that there was going to be a separate process once the policy was created for us to be able to look at individual conservation lands and try to come up with a management regime for those. Um, so I just didn't see it as part of the committee's charge to do that. So I'm not sure what the sort of management um, elements that Alex was referring to might take into consideration. Okay, we have uh, about a minute and a half left and we will end at one o'clock out of courtesy to everybody. So I, I will just say to Aaron, I have copies of everything that we have worked on and I think my copies are the most current. I'm not sure how they compare with yours, but I'm happy to work on that. And I will say that I still favor going through the summer uh, and just do the best we can. I'll be taking a two week vacation from August 3 to August 17. I plan on attending the commission meeting during that time. Dave? No, I, I, I'm fine with, with this discussion and, and sticking with the, the summer program. I think, you know, as Aaron's schedule and my schedule allows, we will we will come in or or come out of these meetings uh, depending. And and Aaron has has made it clear, you know, given her workload that that there are some challenges. So I think to Bruce's point, if if you meet with us, that's fine. Yeah. So let's Aaron, let's it's my understanding that Aaron's half time wetlands administrator and the other half is duties is assigned by you, Dave. Um so if there's some way to free up that other half, like for example, uh, that her work on the open space plan is part of the other half of her time rather than a wetlands administrator. If there's other things that are in that other half that you have control over that you could free up, uh, that might be another strategy to help us get this across the finish line. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a long list of other things that are very yeah. pressing that have been getting put off, like a comprehensive operation and maintenance plan for our conservation lands, which bog bridging, trail repairs, I mean, culvert removals yeah. that I've been putting off with Brad Bordewick for over a year now. So I have I was wow. intending to start that in July as well, but the open yeah. space plan is just more than I can manage in a month. We're classically overcommitted and under-resourced and that unfortunately isn't going to change but at the end of the day i will say that i am firmly believing believe that amherst is trying to do more on conservation than most communities so aaron and i yeah. strive very 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 high can i end the meeting by saying this we just got another grant thanks in large part to aaron's effort for hickory ridge um over a hundred thousand dollars in a trail a trails grant a dcr trails grant so thanks to aaron's hard work uh, that money will go toward making a much needed connection between the new ada loop trail at hickory and the north south trail and it'll include rehabbing one of the main bridges over the fort river so thanks to aaron for her hard work on getting that grant in and and we just heard about that in the last 48 hours or so or 72 hours um, Dave, can you stay on after this? I have an off topic. Erin uh, can stay too if she wants, but I have an off topic question. Very briefly, because I'm starving and I may fall down, but yes, as long as it's brief. Yeah, it, I, it, it's it's a quick one, I think. Yep. Go Thank ahead. you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. I have Great a motion day. to close. I move to close the meeting. I second. I'm not supposed to be able to do that, but Bruza is not here. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Um, this has to do with the beaver problem over by um, the Fort River on um, Pomeroy Lane mm -hmm. or West Pomeroy Lane. I, you know, there was a, an emergency cert issued for that, and we had comments on it the last Conservation Commission. I went to look at that, mm -hmm. and I stood on the road uh, looking at both ends of the culvert, and I saw zero flow. And uh, and it, and it, and I concluded that there may be the the hydraulic control on the north side of the road, um, which is not private, which is conservation land. And um, I wanted to talk to Aaron about would it be okay for me to put on my hip boots 
and wander in there to see if in fact there's a beaver dam or some other hydraulic control because we had, we talked about beaver solutions going in there and trying to uh, manage the water level and the way the conversation went it was as though the hydraulic control was on private property on the south side of West Primary. But I, if that was true, then I would have seen flow going through the culvert. Well, a couple of things, uh, Alex, I was not at the meeting where that was talked about, but I did discuss it with Aaron. Um, so so just to orient myself, so on the south side of the, the road, it is private property. On the north side of the road, it is not technically conservation land. It is simply wetland because Hickory Ridge is not conservation land at this point. Okay, um, right. But, yeah. but it's a construction um, site. It, it is. So my oh. understanding... Well, my understanding from from the uh, emergency cert is that the commission uh, basically said to DPW, you must get an assessment from Beaver Solutions as to how to solve this problem, yeah. uh, lowering the water level temporarily with a with a, uh, a, a a breaching process is part of that. So, I. I'm not aware that DPW has been able to get Beaver Solutions because they're so busy there yet, but my inclination is to let Beaver Solutions do their work. They are the experts in Western Mass on Beaver issues, and they will advise DPW both on the dam breaching, but also looking in the multiple culverts there. I think there are three or four small culverts under that under that road, and then they'll also look up. Excuse me, upstream. Yes, upstream to the south uh, at whatever hired, is happening I've, to the south. I've hired Beaver Solutions several times for a wetland yeah. situation in Leverett. Yeah. Uh, at Mount Toby meeting. Yeah. But so, I, um, I wanted to, I would like to go in on my own and walk around in the wetland, but it's a construction site. And so I wanted to know, do I need permission to do that? And And the conversation we had as a commission is that dam breaching also involved heavy machinery on the south side of the, was suggested on the south side. And if the hydraulic controls on the north side, that's not necessary. That would be evident when Beaver Solutions looks at it. But uh, I have- I think the, bre the breaching itself is happening on the north side, not the south side. Because the well, water is flowing to the north, to the Fort River. So I'm a little confused. Right. But there's yeah. no flow going through the culvert. I I think there may be there's water flowing over and through the small dam on the north side. So there's got to be even very infinitesimal. There's got to be movement of water there right. so, or the road would be inundated at this right. point. So the discussion at the Conservation Commission is that if you breach the dam, the beavers will rebuild it in a night. Beaver Solutions can come up with a method, as they always do or most of the time do, to control the water level. Um, and we're both sort of familiar with how they do that. But I, the conversation um, was confusing um, during the Conservation Commission. It wasn't clear whether we were talking about the north side or the south side of the river. But so that's why I stopped by. And um, I have plenty of experience with beavers and I, I wanted to walk in and look at the dam myself. But on the south side, as well as the north side, but the north side's private property, I'd have to ask permission. I think you're flipping I, that the south side is private and the north side is public, yes. Yeah, yeah, right. And, but the north, the north side is a construction site, keep out. And um, even though no construction is happening in the wetland, is there any problem with me putting on my hip boots and wandering in there? On the south side, yes, I don't think you have permission to go on private property there. I I guess my only advice, there, Alex, is um, to what end? For what purpose? I mean, you are a member of the con. You remember, you're you're. It's public land. You can legally wander in there. Um, but the commission, as a body, has spoken on this issue. So you are. Are you going there as a private citizen or are you going there as a conservation commission member? You've not been authorized to look into this situation any further. You're welcome to go in there. Um, the, the DPW has their marching orders from the commission, which is to 
basically get advice and or hire Beaver Solutions to come up to with a long term solution for that. Uh, right. For and that it, was me, it was me who asked for that amendment to the letter that you signed to them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, which is so great. Why would I go there to inform myself better? Um, whether I go there as a private citizen or a conservation commission, I don't, I'll do, I'll do whichever I need to do. Um, but I would like to be better informed. Again, it's, it's public land. So you can walk in there on your own. Um, just like Thanks. you can walk anywhere at Hickory. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, while I was at Hickory, I pulled into the parking lot by, um, by the clubhouse and that 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 parking lot which i thought was supposed to remain vacant is full of equipment and piles of gravel and the road the the, the trail is closed it's and, a construction site yeah the trail yeah the trails sure, are closed sure. while there's construction going on yeah yeah there's uh, yeah there's caution tape i mean technically there are no official trails <laughs> At Hickory, until we're done, there are no, and, and we open the trails, there really aren't any formal trails at Hickory anyway. Yeah, well, I've walked through there before. Uh, oh, yeah. Early Every, on, and people walk through there all the time. Yeah, no, I'm saying practically it's hard to fence off or close off 150 acres of land, but, um, you know, with construction going on at the um, at the solar site, as well as on the trails, it's hard to to kind of manage and keep people out. We just want to make sure nobody gets hurt uh, or trips over something or, you know, gets in the way of a piece of equipment. Thank you. Yep. That's all. all right. Have Bye -bye. a great day. Bye. Bye.